Reading, of course, from the authorized version of the scriptures. From the book, the prophecy of Jeremiah, chapter 25, verses 4 on to verse 7. Please, get your authorized version of the scriptures. And please follow me along at the scriptures that we will be looking at today. Please follow me along, word for word, verse by verse. Check me out. Check me out. Keep me accountable. Make sure I'm not skipping a groove. Make sure I'm telling you the truth. If you have to, pause the video and read the context in its entirety. Read the whole chapters. Uh, that we look at today if you have to. Do what you must, but follow me along. It's important. It's important. Check me out. Okay? Reading from Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 4 on to verse 7. And the Lord hath sent unto you all his servants the prophets, rising early and sending them, But ye have not hearkened, nor inclined your ear. They said, Turn ye again now, every one from his evil way, and from the evil of your doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever. And go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them, and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands. And I will do you no hurt. Other gods. Oh, other gods. Say like yourself. Not just the little marionette statue, dear friend. But the one that you look at in the mirror. The one that you truly worship. Because you are the standard of truth for a lot of you, aren't you? I'm not addressing the Church of the Living God, by the way, when I say that. Those of you who are truly saved, born again, converted, <laughs> I would, that comment was not aimed at you. But, verse 7. Yet ye have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord, that ye might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. If you've had any dealings with Christians, I'm not a Christian, by the way. I'm of the Church of God or the Church of the Living God. You might see older videos from, wow, four years ago, where I referred to myself as a Christian. And you might see older videos where I refer to the scriptures as a Bible. But I don't anymore. And actually, I oppose such. Why? Why? Because we are on a walk with our Lord Jesus Christ. And every day you ought to learn something new of our Lord Jesus Christ. God our Father, through his word, the authorized version of the scriptures. And a while ago, the Lord Jesus Christ, through his word, convicted me mightily about having what we say line up with the scriptures as close as possibly that we are able to do so. Hence, Christian, I have removed it from my vocabulary except when to speak against it because of what the devil has turned it into. And the scriptures, I used to refer to this as a Bible. It even says it on there, right? But within the pages of the scriptures, it never refers to itself as such. And you know what? I take the word of God seriously. I really do. But see, if you have any dealings with Christians, I'm not a Christian. Remember, Catholics are Christians. Okay? You will come across some 
who will basically, in an argument to defend their sin, say unto you, Why so serious? Why so serious? <laughs> or, you're, you're going to extremes that the Lord doesn't want us to go to. And that part right there, the extremes, that will be, um, that will be the topic of another video. Uh, to be honest with you, I've um, got quite a few notes here. But the part where extremism is concerned, because what, what do people um, who are uh, lost sinners, who go by their feelings and follow their heart, and you're a fool if you follow your own heart, um, they call people Christian extremists, right? And of course, you do have those Christian extremists, which are cults. Cults such as Roman Catholicism. Cults such as some of the Baptist persuasion. Cults such as the Charismatics. Even them old-time holiness preachers. And you know what? Cults even like the Calvinists. Oh! Yes! You heard me say it. Calvinism. Pretty much a cult. Even some King James Bible believing Christians, <laughs> you know, who worship a man. Sieg Heil! Ooh, excuse me. Hail Germany! Oh, excuse me. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, even some of King James Bible believing Christians are very cult like. That will be a topic for another video. I had thought to add that within this video today, but the Lord has, has otherwise. The whole Lord has otherwise. If you, like I've said, if you have run into any Christian and you are of the Church of the Living God, seeking to live your life according to the Scriptures, and you want nothing to do with worldly things, you hate television, you hate looking like the world, you hate thinking like the world, you hate doing things of the world. You hate the world. And you want nothing to do with it. You want to be holy, other, separate than. And you run into a Christian who, if you get the chance, it's like, well, you, you know, the scriptures say what you're doing. If any man be a friend of the world, he is the enemy. Don't judge me. Okay. Okay, um, be not like the world, uh, uh, but be transformed. Uh, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You're taking the Word of God a little too seriously. You ever, have, you, have you ever encountered that? Like I said, the thing about you're going to extremes, we're going to deal with in another video. But the basis, the basis is there are those who take the Word of God seriously and those who do not. And a good example of those who do not is that scoundrel devil David Wood. Like, uh, and I, I did something about this in the comment section. Uh, a dear brother left a comment about David Wood that for some reason it wasn't showing up. I don't know why, brother. I, you're even one of those, um, uh, what do you call them, Moderator, guys, user, user, whatever. But um, David Wood is entertainment to deflect attention away from the Vatican and put it onto the Muslims. And David Wood is a perfect example of someone who doesn't take the word of God seriously. If he did, he wouldn't have made a video with him wearing a dress. That's all I got to say about that. Okay, Done the two videos about that heretic, that's it. Okay. And then there are those of us who do take the word of God seriously, who tremble at his word. And see, Christians, Christians, who, when they go to church buildings, nowadays, they don't even, they don't even take a Bible with them, but just sit there 
and expect to be fed by a Jesuit trained cemeterian. And then when you speak to a Christian about the scriptures, what do you generally run into? What do you generally run into? But don't judge me. You're being too extreme. Oh, don't, don't take it too seriously. You're taking it way too seriously. Or, or what else happens? It's, uh, um, they try to turn the tables on you. And like I mentioned in the previous video, I think, it's amazing how Christians who are not taught to rightly divide the word of truth in order to defend their sin, they'll suddenly become dispensational. Perfect example, tattoos. You're not supposed to print any marks upon you. Nor print any marks upon you. Okay? Different direction within the same sentence. You shall make no cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. Okay? Not supposed to get tattoos. And what do some Christians who are not taught to rightly divide the word of truth, what will they do? Well, that was the Old Testament. Oh, so you rightly divide the word of truth, huh? Oh, good, good, good. And this dispensation ends, and then it's going to be the time of Jacob's trouble. Well, it's faith and works. It's faith alone from Genesis to honor Revelation. It's like, wait, 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 wait. You just said that tattoos were under the Old Testament. Yes, but it's faith alone. The gospel of Jesus Christ from Genesis on to Revelation. <laughs> you see what I mean? Another one. God loves you. And God's not mad at you if you want to be a sodomite. Love is love. Isn't it? I've seen that on billboards of church buildings today. Well, that's how it was under the Old Testament. Not today. Love is love. Really? Really? What about Paul who uh, mentions about those who defile him themselves with mankind? Okay. What about Romans chapter 1? Or, oh, no, excuse me. What is that? Uh, yeah, that's Romans chapter 1. Mm -hmm. Where Paul talks about men with men. And even the women using the natural use of man, stuff like that. I just brad eyes that. Yeah. Oh no, but that's for the Old Testament. See, they become suddenly dispensational to suit their own agenda. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's the difference between someone who doesn't take the Word of God seriously. Only when it comes to defend their, themselves and their own beliefs or their own opinions, not what's there, the Scriptures, versus someone who takes the Word of God seriously and seeks to live their life by it. But then they say, well, then why aren't we putting people to death? you got to rightly divide the Word of Truth, my friend. And see, if you took the word of God seriously, you would rightly, you would study to shew thyself approved unto God, okay, be, to be a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth would, if one were to do that, you know, though, you know, it would settle so much problems. Really would. But see, Christians are not taught that. They're not. Like I said, they don't even carry Bibles to churches. Not, never, not, never mind the scriptures. And those who do, eh, they're usually in the church building of an ite. Okay? But let's look at this. Go to Psalms. The book of Psalms. The very first Psalm. The very first Psalm. We're going to see the contrast right away. Love the book of Psalms, by the way. Life is in the Psalms. We've talked about this before. The very first Psalm in the book of Psalms is very telling. Midway um, uh, in the Psalms, Psalm, what is it, I believe 75, talks about someone uh, midway through their walk with the Lord, and then the last five Psalms in the book of Psalms say, Praise ye the Lord, how you are to go out. Praising the Lord. But, Psalm 1. We're going to see this contrast here, okay? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel 
of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So blessed is the man that is separate from that, who doesn't want anything to do with that. Okay? But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now, Psalms were written under the dispensation of the law, which was faith and works. This is instruction in righteousness for us, okay? But where, where do you read about the law? In the scriptures. Okay? And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, and out of his belly shall come all... Uh, uh, living waters, like our Lord Jesus Christ says in John chapter 4. Okay? And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So, we see right away in the be very beginning of the Psalms the life of someone of the church of the living God. I would say. What do you see right away? Admonition. To not walk with ungodly people. To not be amongst them. Number two. To delight themselves in the law or for our instruction in righteousness. Where do you find the law? In the scriptures. So, delight themselves in what God has said. Okay? And three. Because they are separate from that and seek in the scriptures. They will be what? They shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Psalm 19. Psalm 19. Which is actually one of my wife's favorite psalms. Psalm 19. Psalm 19, verses 7 on to verse 14. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Where do you get the law from? Scriptures. Where do you get the testimonies from? Scripture. Okay? The statutes of the Lord are right. Again, where do you get the statutes of the Lord? From a Jesuit-run cemetery school? The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. How is it clean? Like it says in Job, something that you ought to have memorized. Job 28, 28. And unto man he said, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. And because one would have wisdom, which is the fear of the Lord, and understanding departing from evil, one will be given, will attain unto true knowledge, which comes from fear of the Lord and departing from evil, which we are already seeing demonstrated in the very first psalm, in the first three verses. You see that? And that's because someone takes seriously what God has said. Okay? See, the Word of God is supposed to change you. You're not supposed to change the Word of God. Okay? But, let's continue. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey, all, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them is great reward. Fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the... Uh, Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, 
nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Go back to Psalm 19. Verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. While the devil most certainly tempted Eve. Yea, hath God said, and we're going to have to look at that today. Yes. Um, man does not know truly what is good or what is evil. Every way of, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. But the Lord pondereth the heart. Yesterday, in having a, a Skype conversation with a, my best friend, we got onto that issue about the heart and how deceitful it is and how only a fool trusts his heart. Keep an eye out for a video from our beloved uh, brother Alexander about that, okay? But we were talking about that, you know. Man, though he is able now, because of the fall, to judge what is good and evil, he can't judge perfectly. Why? Because he's tainted. Man is tainted. Man is a sinner. Man is corrupt. The heart is, uh, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So there's a bias to flesh within man's heart. Man at our best cannot know what is truly good and what is truly evil. But who does? God does. And how do you find out what is truly good and what is truly evil? By reading the scriptures. God's perfect, inerrant, given by inspiration, word of God, the authorized version, not a Bible. There's a difference, dear friend. So, verse 12, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from thee great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now go back to Psalm, the very first Psalm. Okay? Now, now you see in the first three verses of the book of Psalms, the admonition to uh, be not conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay? Romans 12, 1 and 2, okay? And also that we are to search the scriptures daily, whether these things are so. Uh, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Where do you find the law? Now you got to remember, doctrinally and dispensationally, the, most of the Psalms apply for the Old Testament during the uh, dispensation of the law. Doctor, there are doctrines within the Psalms that cross dispensational lines. Yes, there are. But in their totality, therefore, the time that was under the law, and also a lot of them have to do with the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? A lot of them do. But, so you, we keep that in mind. We're looking at this right now for our instruction in righteousness. Okay? You understand? Now, verses 4 under verse 6, the contrast, the contrast. The ungodly are not so, right, right there. Virtually every psalm has a point where the psalm twists. Not twists, but changes its focus and direction. Virtually every psalm. I say virtually because Psalm one, uh, 117, <laughs> two verses, there's not really a shift in there. But virtually all the Psalms have a shift, at least one shift somewhere within them. Okay? That's the beauty that makes a Psalm a Psalm. Okay? Here's the shift in Psalm 1. The ungodly are not so, obviously. Because you begin with what? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Separate than that. Verse 4. The ungodly are not so. Uh, 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 Fanny Crosby could see this uh, change, this shift, okay? 
but are like the chaff, which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. Usually because they don't like judgment. Usually. Or the only judgment they have is against those who speak the truth. You want to get a Christian riled up at you? Start being a witness unto them of the truth of the scriptures. Oh, you'll see that pure the love of God in their heart come right out at you. Yeah, the little G God of this world. Yeah. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. He sure does, and he has declared that way of his righteousness in the scriptures. But the way of the ungodly shall perish. And for this, beautiful here, Psalm 50. Okay, the contrast. Now we already looked at the contrast in verses 1 on, on to verse 3, and we also saw that in Psalm 19. But here, the contrast of the ungodly. Psalm 50, verses 16 on to verse 23. But unto the wicked God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? Seeing thou hatest instruction, and castest my words behind thee. Oh, yeah, buddy. Yeah. 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 That, right, that verse right there sums up Christianity for you. Seeing thou hatest instruction, and castest my words, the authorized version of the scriptures, behind thee. And if they want anything that kind of resembles something like the scriptures, kind of, They'll go to the message. Or the nitwit living in the trash. Thank you, Vato. Okay? <laughs> Long story. Okay? They'll go to an NIV, which is not as bad as the mess, but trash nonetheless. They'll go, see, they'll find, the Christian will find a Bible that suits them. And in the church buildings. The Christian, the Jesuit-trained seminarians will promote that. Find a Bible that speaks to you. Scriptures speak to me. The Scriptures speak to anyone who is truly, genuinely saved. You know what? The Scriptures do speak unto those who are not. That's why they hate it so much, and that's why they want the message. That's why they want the NLT. Or they want to put their faith in cults like Calvinism and John MacArthur. Who is his own God? He is his own standard. And you people, there are people of you out there who are Calvinists who worship that man as God. Because Calvin, hey, Calvinism! Lutheranism, named after a man, okay? Oh, and you want to talk about isms of men, huh? Shh, I know what some of you are thinking. Shh, we'll talk about that in December, okay? Okay, so... But yes... Verse 17 describes Christianity. They hate instruction. They want to live by their feelings. Or if they want to hear anything, they go to a cult because they have trust in man, not in God. When thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers. 
And the thief cometh not but for to kill and to destroy. The thief is the one who boots the door out of the way, and the door is Jesus Christ. The thief comes and boots the door out of the way, and then shouts through the crack. That is what a thief does. That is what a deceiver does. Okay? And the Christian, okay, when thou sawest the thief, Then thou consentest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers. Where the contrast that we already saw in Psalm 1, that blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. But yet the Christian, we don't want to scare people. You've got to be like the world to win the world, right? You're taking the word of God way too seriously. And the Christian doesn't take God's word seriously at all. David Wood, I rest my case. You try, you try to tell me in the comment section that David Wood takes the word of God seriously. What is the word of God, Mr. David Wood, I would ask? He would have a Jesuit James White answer. Whatever suits you. Because guess what, guess what, guess what? Jesuit James White, he could not. And this, brethren... Give the devil his due. He could not honestly sit before you and say to you that there is such a thing as a perfect word of God. Because he works for the Jesuits. Okay? If he... I would have respect for James White. If he were to say the ESV is the perfect word of God. But see, he can't say that. He can't say that. Why? Because if he said that, that would at least turn people to a standard... But see, guys like that, guys like David Wood, guys like uh, Jesuit James White, guys like John MacArthur, okay, they make themselves the standard so people come to them and buy their, their materials, okay? Shh! About other people you're thinking about, hush, hush, not yet, not yet, okay? Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Someone call themselves a Christian and have no problem with profanity. Or, or you just scratch them a little bit, and out comes the profanity. Hey, I dropped the couch on my toe once, and blood just blurted everywhere and I dropped the loudest F-bomb that could have been heard in 10 counties and I was more hurt at the fact that I had dropped an F-bomb than blood that was pulsating from my toe okay that happens but see someone who is of the church of the living God truly saved born again converted we're going to sin every day and when you slip it's like woof Oh, Lord, I, I'm sorry. And then what happens when you want to go take a shower, don't you? you got to clean off that filth. Because that's what the world does. I had a Christian you know, woman out there witnessing and just casually dropping the S word. And even, uh, you know, didn't really take the name of our Lord in vain, but said the Lord's name kind of as an exclamation. And I jumped on that. <laughs> You're a new creature, huh? Yeah. By the way, there's a big difference between being a new creature and having a changed life. So many people who are Christians have a changed life. They just change the way they look. But on the inside, they're still the same old rotten person they were. They just look differently now. There's a difference between a new creature and a changed life. It's another thing that the Lord convicted me on. Because I hear so many people, you know, well, you're going to have a changed life. You're going to have a changed life. Which stems first from being a new creature. That's important. Because you can change your life anytime you really want to, if you set your mind to it. But being a new creature that results in that changed life, and 
changed life? Find it for me, please. Oh, Brad, you're taking the Word of God too seriously. There's some of you out there who ain't taking the Word of God seriously enough. Oh, and then, and really quickly about this thing about going to extremes. Have you ever read Isaiah chapter 53 before? Have you ever read that? Huh? Have you ever read Isaiah chapter 53? You know, like I told uh, my best friend, you know, the next time someone, oh, you're going to extremes that God doesn't want you, want us to go to. After you get over the dumbfoundedness of that statement, simply say, well, then I guess our God who died on the cross in Isaiah 53, that was a pretty extreme act, wouldn't you say? So a God who went to that extreme for us, does that, make, does that mean that we shouldn't be that extreme in loving him for what he did for us? Watch out for people like that, brethren. The Lord rebuke you, by the way. Go into extremes that God doesn't want us to. Now, see, we're going to address that in another video about the cults and the doctrines of men. Absolutely. We're going to address that in another video. But what does our Lord say? If any man uh, love his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, any man who love his son, his son, his daughter, yea, his own life more than me is not worthy of me. And Paul, for us today, I consider all things done that I may win Jesus Christ. Not win him to stay saved, you heretics. No, no, no. But that Christ be first in everything in our lives. But that's too extreme. That's too extreme. Different video. Okay. Let's continue here. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother. Thou slanderest thine own mother's son. Again, we've touched on this recently before. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. But I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. Make God into your own image. Yes, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh, yes. But see, God in flesh did something that you and I could never do. He never sinned and he kept the law perfectly. Hence, in keeping the law perfectly, that is what sanctified the flesh. Okay? That flesh that was sinful. And thank you, by the way, my dear, dear friend. You finally got, got it right. You finally got it right. Yes, you did. Yes. Yes. Good for you. Good for you. Okay? Never mind. That was for whom it is concerned. Okay? But, see, a lot of Christians. Jesus is their homeboy. Gonna get up there and give, him, give Jesus a high five and a bro hug. <laughs> no, you're gonna be weeping and wailing and gnashing your teeth in the lake of fire, dear friend. Why? Because though God was man, God never sinned, unlike man. God experienced everything that you and I will. Every God can't be tempted with evil. But that flesh, oh, that could be tempted. Why? Because, yes, the flesh that God was manifested in. And you got this right. You got this right. Bravo, bravo. The flesh that God was manifested in was sinful. Yes, it was. The flesh was. God within that of sin. But the flesh was sinful. Yes, it was. But see, God did in the flesh what no man could do. He kept the law perfectly. And because he did that unto his death, that flesh was sanctified and holy because he never sinned. Something that we could never do. Okay? And a babe 
of not even six months figured that out. There are those of you who 2009 couldn't figure that out in 25 years. <laughs> but finally, apparently you have. So bravo. Bravo. Good for you. Good. Yes, these things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself, but I will reprove thee, and set them in order before thine eyes. Making God into your own image. Now consider this. Ye that forget God. I don't forget God. I pray to Him every day. But you want nothing to do with His Word, with the Scriptures. You only want to do what makes you feel good. And then when you come across something that conflicts with your feelings, then what happens? You don't take the Word of God seriously. You cast His words behind you. Don't you? Don't you? Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I shew salvation of God. Verse 23, by the way, is works, showing you for what dispensation this was for. But uh, whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. Have you realized that if you live your life according to the scriptures, you're giving praise unto the Lord? Have you ever considered that? How so? Because by living your life in accordance with scripture, you're showing that what God has set out for man to live by actually works. That doesn't make it, that doesn't mean that you should give yourself to pragmatism. Being pragmatic, no, that's sin. Why? Because the devil can answer prayers. The devil can make things apparently seem to work. Got to watch out for pragmatism. Pragmatists like Charles Lawson, you got to watch out for that. I'm well, speaking to you in a church building. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you see, it's a contrast. The contrast. In Psalm 1, verses 1 on to verse 3, those who take the word of God seriously. And verses 4 on to verse 6, don't take the word of God seriously. Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66. One verse. One verse in Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 5. Just one verse. Hear the word of the Lord. Ye that tremble at his word. If David would, <laughs> perfect example. If David would have trembled at the word of God, there's no way he would have done a video with him wearing a dress. Well, he just had a lapse. Okay. Okay. Why isn't there any videos about him saying, hey, I sinned, I should have never, shame on me, I should have never have done that, I repent of that, please take that, nowhere to be found. Doesn't take the word of God seriously. What about these easy believism heretics who call prayer a work? <laughs> and repentance is going from, one, they don't take the word of God seriously. And they call themselves dispensational, but... <laughs> but then again, there also, it's faith alone from Genesis to Revelation. Okay. 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 Yeah. They don't, they don't take the word of God seriously. But for those of us who do, hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. See, that's another reason why a lot of y'all don't like scriptures. That's why you'll go to the mess. Or the NIV. Because it doesn't scare you. And you, you go to your church building. Don't scare them. Love them into the kingdom, right? <coughs> Give me a break, man. Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. 
Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy. They shall be ashamed. Now, when it says brethren there in this context, it's talking about those who are relation. You read the context from, you please, like at the beginning, I said, hey, this would be a good time for you right now. Pause this video, pause it, and read the entirety of Isaiah 66. Okay? And you'll see when brethren here in context is talking about relational brethren. Not one who are of the same God. Okay? You'll see that in context. Okay? But, here and besides, hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Distinction. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, let the Lord be glorified. They thought they were serving the true God, but they aren't. The Christians of today, they're not our brethren. Okay? They think they're serving the true God. You come to them with the truth of Scripture, they hate you. But you come to them, God loves you. God loves you unconditionally. Oh, come on in. Oh, you're dressed like a whore? Oh, come on in. Oh, you're a sodomite? Come on in. Oh, you're a Christian and you're wearing sleeveless shirts, boasting of your tattoos because you have the grace to do so? Yeah, give me a break. Yeah. Let but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. Why? Because when we get redeemed, and all these Christians get left behind, and see by then, dear friend, it's too late for you. You're going to be going into the time of Jacob's trouble, which is faith and works. You, y'all talk about living it. Okay? Gotta live it. We should strive to live it today. Absolutely. But, if you've ever read Romans chapter 7, you know how hard that really is to do. You always seem to miss the mark. Two steps forward, or one step forward, two steps back, right? Right? But during the time of Jacob's trouble, boy. You cowards out there who won't take a stand for the word of God, but will stand against those who stand for the word of God. You think you're going to stand for God when your life depends on it? How can you? How do you expect to make a stand for God when your life depends on it, when you can't stand for the truth of God today? But you think... All of a sudden, you're going to have the uh, machismo to do so? When you won't do it for today, but yet for today, you will go against those who preach the truth of God's word from the authorized version of the scriptures. They, them, you will oppose. But making a stand for the true God of the true scriptures? No, you'll stand for the little G God of this world. God loves everybody unconditionally, even those who reject the gospel and reject the true Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. And scripture says, those people, you reject the, you, you reject the gospel one time. God's love is not for you. His wrath is for you. Okay? You got to be aware of that, dear friend. But see, go to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Okay? Your brethren that hated you. Okay? <laughs> John chapter 16. Verses 1 on verse 3. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. And Jesus is the Father. <laughs> these things will they do unto you because they don't know who God is. One God who is made of a spirit, a soul, and a body. You and I are, are made in the image of God. How? We have a spirit. We have a soul. We have a body. 
Okay? Not three persons that make one God. Like that buffoon David Wood made that horrendous video. One plus one plus one equals one. While the Muslims and the atheists mock the Trinity, and rightfully so. And rightfully so. Okay? Now, this will be fulfilled more so during the time of Jacob's trouble. John chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. But today, oh, these Christians, they think they're doing God's service when they come against the uh, legalist people who believe in the authorized version of the scriptures and seek to live their life by example according to it. They don't take the word of God seriously. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 on to verse 8. And see, one of the arguments that people who don't take the word of God seriously. What, what is one of their arguments about? And this is something that these those devils, uh, uh, Bible is mark of beast. This is one of their one of their pig arguments. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 on verse 8. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament? Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. See, now right away, they say, the letter, so the Scriptures. He's talking about against the Scriptures. But let's keep reading to verse 8. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Hmm. Now see, going back to verse 6, these, these people who want to get people away from the Scriptures so that they will follow man instead, they come to verse 6 and they say, who, hath also, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. So they say, put, put away the Scriptures, because the Scriptures kill, you know, uh, Phil Johnson and uh, that, that devil witch, that harlot from Bible is Mark of Beast, they, and John Boshoff. You know, put the, put the Bibles away. Yeah, put your Bibles away. Pick up the Scriptures. But the, the Scriptures, no, they kill. The letter kills. What is he talking about? The letter killeth, I will tell you. Romans chapter 7. Okay? What is Paul talking about when he says the letter killeth? He's talking about the letter of the law. He's talking about the Old Testament law. He's not talking about the scriptures. Okay? Romans chapter 7, verses 7 on to verse 14. Okay? What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay. I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law say, had said, Thou shalt not covet. And then there are those of you out there when you find out what God says that you're doing is sin. That's when, well, the, the letter killeth. But today, the spirit is life. Because God is spirit. No, God is a spirit, dear friend. The Bibles take out the A. God is a spirit. So see, God gives you a perfect standard so that you are able to discern what spirit it is. God is a spirit. Because when you fall into the trap of God is spirit, how are you supposed to, especially when they tell you not to, have you, can't you figure that out? You Christians out there, you atheists? You Christians basically are atheists. Okay? You basically are. Okay? Haven't you figured that out? They're all about not judging, but yet they say God is spirit. But yet, don't judge. But yet the scriptures tell us we have to judge because God is a spirit. And I guess, hey, right brother? 2 plus 2 equals 36 after all, doesn't it? Yeah. 
Romans chapter 7. Let's continue. Verse 8. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. You didn't know what sin was until the Lord told you what sin was. Now you know what sin is. You ain't no longer ignorant. You can't say, well, I didn't know. There ain't one uh, innocent, ignorant person in hell. There isn't one innocent or ignorant person in hell. There were a lot. There are a lot of people who were willfully ignorant, who heard the truth but don't want to accept or believe the truth. Willfully ignorant, yeah, but truly ignorant, not knowing better. There ain't one person in hell, a person, spirit, soul, and body. Uh, there ain't one in hell who uh, is ignorant or innocent. Now, granted, the bodies right now rot and whatnot. True, true. But people in hell, they ain't innocent and they ain't ignorant. Let's continue. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Yeah, because you didn't know what it was sin, that it was sin, and then you came, found out that it was sin, and it's like, what I'm doing God hates and is against and calls it sin. What do you do with that? And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Well, that's a contradiction, isn't it? No, it's not. It's ordained unto life, how? To keep you away from sin. Okay? It keeps you away from sin. But see, it's found unto death because number one, it kills your pride. And number two, it kills you in the fact that you quickly realize that, hey, I can't live it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Nobody could. Nobody can. Only one could. And that was Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay? God manifest in the flesh. He was the only one. He is the only one who can keep the commandments perfectly without, without ever sinning. Okay? All right? That's what made him a perfect sacrifice. He never sinned. Hence, because he never did anything to, to defile his flesh. Not once. Okay? Not once. Not even an evil thought. Okay? Hence, because God did what no man could do, that alone is what sanctified his sinful flesh. You get it? Like I said, a babe of not even six months old figured that one out. Okay? But let's continue. So, the law, the commandment, was ordained to life to keep you from those things that God says is sin. But it's death because, number one, it kills your pride. I, I can't, it kills your pride. I, I want that. You can't have it. I want that. You can't have it. And two, it kills you in the fact that I can't do this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's impossible. Only God could do it. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. How did sin take an occasion by the commandment? Like uh, the temptation in the Garden of Eden. Look at those, look at those, look at that fruit on that tree. Doesn't that look good? Doesn't it look beautiful? Look, look at that married woman over there. Oh, she got eye for you, boy. You're a married man. But that... What your wife don't know ain't gonna hurt her. Definitely ain't gonna hurt you. Then that don't she look so beautiful over there, man? Oh, look at that woman. Look at how she looks dressed like a harlot. Oh fine, right? Sin is made to look good, isn't it? The devil does that quite well. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy. And the commandment holy and just and good. God's perfect requirements under the law. Hey, you want to you wanna make me happy? Keep my commandments. 
Guess what? You can't keep them perfectly. You need God. And only God could do what he could. Only God could keep the commandments perfectly. Jesus Christ did. Okay? Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid! Because he just called and said it was good and holy because that was God's perfect uh, commandments to, make, to be right with him in that dispensation. But Paul here, and we, we, we've done a whole video on Romans 7. Paul realizes, it's like, even at my best state, I'm vanity, I can't do it. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, carnal, carne, fleshly, sold under sin. Okay. And also now, go to Romans, uh, Romans, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. See, the letter killeth. Paul is talking about what we just looked at in Romans chapter 7, dear people. He's talking about the Old Testament law. That's what he's referring to. He's not referring to the printed pages of Scripture. Devils who want to keep you away from what God has said have lied to you for centuries about that. Literally centuries. Galatians chapter 3, verses 21 under verse 25. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, Verily, righteousness should have been by the law. Now you might be saying, well, isn't that a contradiction? No. No. The law was there to keep you from sin, but it couldn't give you life because you it killed you, your pride, because it, it tells you what you can't do. And because of the fall uh, at the beginning of Scripture in Genesis, the fall of man, we want to touch that red button that all the warnings are... Don't, whatever you do, do not touch the red button. Or in some places, do not eat the white men in the urinal. Okay? Forgive me, that's a little grotesque. But the point is, your flesh wants what God says you can't have. See, flesh has its own thing about it, doesn't it? Okay? So, this is not a contradiction. The law was there to keep you from sin, to show you God's perfect requirements. But see, it told you what you can't have. And your flesh don't like that. My flesh don't like that. But also, it killed you. It's like, if I break one commandment, I, 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 I've done blew it all. That's what James says. So you see, it didn't bring life. It kept you. From, from death, yes it did. But in it, in it keeping you from death, it brought you death. Because you couldn't do it perfectly 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, even if your life depended on it. And during, under the law, it did. <laughs> okay? Hence, animal sacrifice. All the ordinances. Okay? Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. And I have that, yes I do. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us on to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. You might be saying, well, Brad, you said that under the law, it's faith and works. Romans chapter 1, please. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 on to verse 17. 
Uh, uh, beg your pardon. Beg your pardon. Mm. Beg your pardon. <clears throat> for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. <laughs> Beg your pardon. I kind of had to say that publicly. Excuse me. Now, verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Faith to faith. We've talked about this many times before. I'm going to hit it again. Faith to faith. Faith in what God will do under the law in the Old Testament. To faith, what God has done, it is finished. Okay? From faith to faith. Okay? That's what that means. So, dear friend, so, dear friend, when you read in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, okay? See, this is one of the tricks that the devil has deceived so many of you Christians over because you don't want to take the word of God seriously. You say, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. They come to this and say, well, the letter, the printed, printed letter of Scripture, that kills. No, he's talking about the law. And the spirit is life. What spirit? God is a spirit. But no, you Christians, God is spirit. So you can't decide which one is which because you can't judge because judges, judging is a sin according to you Christians. And you don't have a perfect standard. John MacArthur is your standard or some nonsense like that. This all happens because you don't want to take what God said seriously. And we are told in Scripture, you know, Romans chapter 15, very familiar verses, very familiar verses, okay? Romans chapter 15. We, we can't talk about this enough. We can't talk about this enough. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So Paul was uplifting, telling people to search the, Acts chapter 17, which that idiot David Wood named his channel after, yeah, uh, being a good Berean and searching these scriptures daily, whether these things are so, and that guy hardly ever uses a Bible even in his videos. Never uses the scriptures, but the Bible, not, not even a Bible. Yeah, but you trust them, yeah, right. But see, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. See, God doesn't save you. So you can be an aimless ship in the sea being carried about by every wind of doctrine. That's what Christianity tells you. See, the Jesuit trained cemeterians in the Christian church buildings don't want you in the scriptures. No, they want you to pay attention to them so that they can guide you by the winds that blow from the Vatican. See how that works? Hey, you're watching me, whoever you are. You're not saved. You're a Christian. You're offended. Here, get the authorized version of the scriptures. Here, read the scriptures. The scriptures. scriptures. And also now go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Of course, we have to go there. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verses 15 on to verse 17. See, Paul's telling, uh, admonishing to be in the scriptures. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God 
and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof and correction, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And the scriptures he's talking about was the Old Testament too, by the way, because at this time, yes, the completed canon of scripture wasn't available yet. But even so, we have it today, and we are to follow and take what God says very seriously, dear friend. Okay? And see, go to Romans chapter 10 now. And see, the people who are in the cemetery schools today, okay? What, what, what was that? I beg your pardon, brethren. The people who are in the cemetery schools today. One second, please. See, the preachers that are in this, uh, the church buildings that are coming from Jesuit trained cemetery schools. They're not rightly dividing the word of truth. They're not preaching from the authorized version of the scriptures. And they are guiding people unto hell. Guiding people away from the true God of the scriptures. While someone who takes the word of God seriously, someone who is of the church of the living God, will, they will find, you know, be under or themselves to preach the word of God as a witness unto the lost. Here, let me show you. Romans chapter 10, verses 14 on to verse 17. Okay? How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now granted, not everyone is a preacher, but we are ambassadors for Christ, having the ministry of reconciliation and the word of reconciliation. We are ambassadors for Christ. And, you know, you can have a moment to preach to someone. Being a preacher is not always someone that stands behind a pulpit, sits behind a, a desk at a computer. That is not always the measure of a preacher. That is what we always intuit as a preacher. You can be out there on the street preaching to people uh, and without a pulpit or without any of this and still be a, considered a preacher, okay? All right? And remember, <laughs> all women are not supposed to be preachers. Just remember that. Just remember that. A little rabbit trail for you in there, okay? But, okay, let's continue. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Uh, just because you're uh, behind a pulpit or behind a desk, okay, uh, you may be preaching, yes, but that is not the limit to what being a preacher is. You know, being out on the street, you know, preaching, okay, street preaching as it is called, okay, you got to remember, all right, and, and look at verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? So wait. The ones that only go to a cemetery school are the ones that are to preach the gospel? Aren't we all ministers of reconciliation? But we're not all preachers. We're not all preachers in meaning that God hasn't chosen everyone to do this, per, uh, this primarily. But at some point or another, brethren... You have been in a, mo in a position where you have preached the gospel. Have you not? If you haven't, then what do you do? Sit in your house all day? Watch YouTube videos? Huh? But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by your feelings. Oh, hearing by the word of God. See, verses 14 on to verse 17 is there addressing for those whom the Lord sends out to preach his word. Now, not everybody is called to the, to the position of a preacher, okay? 
Like, the Lord has put me in this position. This is what I do. This is how I give back to the Lord for what He has given me. This is what I do. Okay? This is what He has called me to. Okay? There are others who have been called to this. Okay? Okay? And that's legitimate. Not everybody has been called to this. But at some point in your walk with the Lord, whether it's at the grocery store, in the parking lot, or just passing by, you have been given the opportunity to preach. And you right away you think a preach preaching is someone doing this, a sermon. That's not always preaching. Look at verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, the death, burial, and resurrection. Of our Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of peace. Okay? And bring glad tidings of good things. That the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth away all sins. Okay? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And of course, John 17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. What is his word? What is his word? Oh, it's found somewhere in that mess of Bibles. No, no, what is his word? The authorized version of the scriptures. And on that, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 on to verse 19. Finally, my brethren, talking to saved people, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. The whole armor. Don't just put on the, the shoes and the, the breastplate. Put on the whole armor. Okay? Put on the whole armor of God. Why? That ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. <laughs> All the attacks that you get, the threats, the links to pornography, but praise the Lord that has... That has ceased. Because I really don't want to make a video exposing people for doing that. But, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's talking about Satan. How he is the little g-god of this world. And he is in control of all those in the upper echelons, the head of the pyramid. Okay? All right? Wherefore, take on to you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And so many are not prepared, not wearing the whole armor of God. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. It begins with truth. What is truth? What is truth, right? That's what Pilate asked. While speaking the truth personified in Jesus Christ. What is truth? That's your truth, not my truth. Uh, sanctify them through thy truth. That word is truth. Well, that's truth to you, not to me. You're lost. Okay? You're lost. You, you, you don't even have a sure word of prophecy in the Bibles. Give me a break. Okay? Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. And having on the breastplate which covers your heart of righteousness. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Remember what we just looked at in Romans? Uh, about those who are sent, having your feet shod, being, uh, being instant, in season, out of season. Be ready. That's why I always tell you, always, I don't care if you're going out to get the, the mail, putting garbage out in the garbage dump. I don't care if you're just going outside for a moment. Take a sword with you. Take the scriptures with you. The Lord is my witness. Whenever my body, whenever I go out that door, I don't care if it's just going out to walk Xena or to get the mail or whatever I do. Whenever I leave that door, I always, I have a little pocket Cambridge, always put, always take the sword with me. Because I'll tell you, brethren, one time, and this has only happened once, but one time 
that I went out without a sword and the Lord orchestrated something and I blew it because I didn't have the sword on me. I've never forgotten that. I've never forgotten that. Lord willing, that will never happen again. And thus far, knock on wood, it hasn't. I spare you that. Because that's the type of failure that I would want to spare anyone. Knowing that if only you had the sword of the Spirit. Well, I don't know where to find uh, If the Lord Jesus Christ is in you, God our Father, the Lord is that Spirit. He'll guide you into all truth. He orchestrates a moment for you out there. And you got the sword of the Spirit. He'll guide you into all truth. Trust me when I tell you that, okay? Trust the Lord, okay? He'll guide you into all truth. Have the sword on you at all time, man. Woman, you're a woman, you got a purse, why? Uh, have the scriptures. You're a man, you take your wallet with you, right? You take your keys with you, huh? Some of you, you unfortunately, you smoke, you take your smokes and a lighter with you, right? Take the keys to the camper, what, you can't go out the door without a set of scriptures on you? Yeah, you can't leave home without your cell phone, right? What, you can't leave the, uh, the, your house, your front door without a set of scriptures on you, huh? I spare you. Knowing that you failed the Lord because of something simple that you didn't do. I'll tell you, if you go through that, you probably will never want to go through it again. Let's continue. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of, gospel of peace, being instant in season, out of season. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. And you get the thing about the shield is, yeah, it protects everything, but every once in a while, you got to lower the shield so you can survey the battlefield and then put the shield back up. Keep that in mind. Okay? And take... The helmet of salvation, which covers your head. The helmet of salvation. Knowing that if you come to the Lord on his terms, broken, contrite, and in fear of him, you call upon his name and he save you. You are sealed until the day of redemption. Once saved, always saved. You can make a mess out of your life. You can blow it for, uh, supremely. You are sealed. You are saved. You're going to heaven no matter what. So, that helmet, be confident. When you got some putts saying, are you, you know, questioning you whether or not you are truly saved? Okay? When you are one of the church of the living God, adhering to the authorized version of the scriptures, and then you got a Christian from a church building, oh, you're, you're preaching division. You're preaching against God. Uh, yeah, amen. Being separate from that. Amen. Oh, Amen. You're right. I am preaching division. God is a God who divides sheep from goats. Amen. 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 I am preaching division. Division from that. Amen. Amen. Okay? Amen, amen. And take the helmet of salvation. And the sword of the Spirit, <laughs> which is the Word of God. Sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And, then f and for me, that utterance. See? See how this ties in with Romans chapter 10? And for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Okay? But see what happens with the Jesuit-trained cemeterians in the church buildings, the Christians. We have a perfect standard. And we who are saved, born again, converted to the church of the living God, we take this word seriously. Okay? We take the word of God seriously. But see what the devil does. As he did from the very beginning. Genesis chapter 3. Verses 1 and verse 5. Now the serpent. This is Satan. Was more subtle than any beast of the field. Which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman. Yea. 
hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The very first thing that's recorded in Scripture for us in Genesis, the beginning, Satan, which is the serpent, okay, first thing he did was question what God said. What do Christians in the buildings do? Yeah, hath God said. Some, hey, some of you Christians might go to a building where they read the authorized version of the Scripture, but yet their practices are not based off of the Scripture, but are based off of the things of Catholicism. They really are. Like I said, more on that in the video about extremes. Okay? But yeah, Catholics, they have their, their own traditions. Baptists, Charismatics, Calvinists, Lutherans, Zichael, okay? They have their own traditions. Yea, hath God said. Okay? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of, eat of it. And God never said this part, Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Look right across to the page, and it says in verse 17 in Genesis chapter 2, we've been over this a myriad of times, we're going over it again. Deal with it. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. He never said anything about touching it. Interesting. And verse, uh, where, uh, verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, he shall not surely die. You're not going to die. Come on. And see, the death they were thinking of was immediate. And it didn't happen immediately. The only thing that died immediately was an animal to give the skins. There are some out there who like to argue, say, well, God might have kept the animal alive and took the skin off. So our God, our Father Jesus Christ, is a God who likes to pluck the wings off of flies. I'm like, no, no. An animal died right away. Man didn't. Gradually he did. But see, they were thinking immediate, which didn't happen immediate. Spiritually, yes, but actually, physically, no. That took almost a thousand years. But, and the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. This is what's going on today. For God doth know in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And man, it's proven, it's a scientific proven fact that man does not know what is truly good, what is truly evil. All you have to do is look at American culture today. That's all I gotta say. That's all I gotta say. Look at American culture. Look at America. Man does not know what is truly good and what is truly evil. I think we do. Because we make ourselves the measure of judgment. Hence, Satan's lie. You shall be as gods. Whatever makes you feel good. And let's read verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, oh, it looked so beautiful. And then it was pleasant to the eyes. Oh, oh, that'll fill me up. Oh, that looks so good. Just like all sin does. It'll fill you up. Oh, it looks so good. Yeah. And a tree that desired to make one wise. Oh, God, what the God. Yeah, yeah, whatever you say here. Yeah, I don't want to... Be wiser, because I know what's good and evil. I know what's good. I know when to quit. Well, ain't gonna hurt me, right? Oh, that looks so beautiful. She took up the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And here we are today. And here we are today. Yea, hath God said. And I'm gonna touch this. Amos chapter eight. Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8, verses 11 on to verse 12. Now, 
hold on. Amos chapter 8, verses 11 on to verse 12. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send, that I will send. The Lord will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We already looked at that in Romans, right? Let's read. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Now, this will be fulfilled in its entirety during the time of Jacob's trouble. Why? Why? I'll tell you why. Look at verse 11 where it says, not a thirst for water, uh, not a famine of bread, nor thirst for water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. The words of the Lord, excuse me. Today, people are hearing the words of the Lord. Hearing them at least to aggravate them enough to attack you for it, or being cut to the heart where they, they close their ears and they gnash on you with your, uh, their teeth, or they're hearing the word of God and it pricks them in their heart and they say, men and brethren, what shall we do? Why is that? Because the church of the living God is on earth today, the body of Christ. But see, what ends this dispensation is when the church of the living God, the body of Christ, gets redeemed. The redemption of the purchased possession. Talked about in Ephesians. Caught up ridiculously, erroneously referred to as the pre-tribulation rapture. Okay, It's the redemption of the purchased possession or the catching away of the body of Christ. Okay, God is omnipresent. God is omnipotent. During the time of Jacob's trouble, there will be 144,000 sealed Jews on the earth which will preach what? The gospel of the coming kingdom. The coming kingdom of heaven. Okay. Also, the Lord will have two witnesses. Who, and you read about in the book of Revelation, uh, those two witnesses will be Moses and Elijah. Okay, uh, they they going they don't gonna get killed. And people, see, this is why it's I'm such so against Christ Mass because in the book of Revelation you're gonna have the the people sending each other gifts. As if it were Christ Mass for the death of the two witnesses of our Lord. I'm not saying. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. I would not be surprised that the death of the two witnesses will fall on or around in the month of December. You Christians that get left behind. You, you watch. You watch. Christ Mass for that man of sin, the son of perdition? You watch. You Christians, you know, you know, God loves you. Yeah. Followed being led by the Jesuits. Yeah. You watch. You watch. Son of perdition? Oh, he going to make big to do about Christ Mass. You watch. You watch. You watch. You'll see. You'll see. But see, once we are taken up, God's witness, his body is no longer on the earth. There will be those who will give testimony unto him. But see, today in this dispensation, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when his body is gone from the earth and his attention is turned to the Jews, hearing of the words of the Lord. Why? Because you got to remember during the time of Jacob's trouble, uh, midway through, the mark of the beast is going to be implemented. It's in the right hand or in the forehead. And if someone takes the mark of the beast during the time of Jacob's trouble, you are ipso facto, no questions, nothing. You're going to hell no matter what. You can't lop it off or gouge it out. Once you take it, you're done. And once someone takes that, they're going to be an enemy of God. They won't be able to hear it anyway. And some will say, well, the scriptures are not going to be available. Uh, 
first couple of years that are going to be so chaotic because that man of sin, the son of perdition, is going to be going forth conquering and to conquer. Okay? Um, we don't know what he's going to try to do to the Word of God. The Word of God endures forever, the authorized version of the Scriptures. Okay? Uh, they, this says, verse 12, And they shall wander from sea to sea and from north, from the north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. That's pretty that's pretty dire. But we know that the word of the Lord endureth forever, though. That's talking about the panic that our Lord talks about in Matthew chapter four or twenty-four, when they see the abomination of desolation standing in the temple, that man of sin, the son of perdition, saying, I'm God, and looking like the Roman Catholic Jesus. They're going to be like, where's the, where, where, where we got to, let's, let's bolt. Okay? But see, today, today, this has not been fulfilled today. Only in part. How? Ye hath God said. Ye hath God said. In the buildings, y'all ain't hearing from the scriptures. And if you are, you have a Jesuit-trained cemeterian speaking to you. Because what? In a church building, what? you got to have the credentials. you got to have a $100,000 piece of paper to show that Jesuits say, I'm, I'm licensed to do this. Nowadays, today, you got to get a health food uh, handler's license here in Illinois to flip a hamburger at McDonald's. you got to go get a license to flip a hamburger, boy. That's Illinois for you, Jack. Yeah, that's Illinois for you. Yeah. You literally have to go get a health food handler's license in order to flip a burger. Unless, of course, you're from another nation. But see, today, people aren't hearing the Word of God. You can readily find, I mean, you can still, you can still find the scriptures in most places, okay? You can still uh, get a copy of the scriptures. But once the, once the body of Christ be redeemed, and that man of sin be revealed, going forth conquering and to conquer, the word of God endureth forever. Yes, it does. But it's going to be very hard to find. Very hard to find. Very hard. The hope is for you, Christians, who get left behind. Who will still, at that moment, still have the scriptures. And realize, oh boy, we're in trouble. That's when you have that chance to be, to redeem something of yourself. Because there's a great multitude that die right at the beginning of the time of Jacob's trouble. I believe it's going to be those who, you Christians, that get left behind and realize, Oh boy, because once the church of the living God get caught up, the Christians that are left behind because they're not saved, they're merely Christians, they're going to realize, some of them are going to be like, oh wow, we were never saved. Oh, oh, oh wow. What did, what, what did those crazy uh, authorized version of the scripture believers say to us? Oh, oh wow. Oh, uh, whoa. Who's that? That's that... Wow, hey guys, that's him. See how that's going to work? But see, that's going to be quick. That's going to be quick. The, the Christian, other Christians who are in the back pocket of that man of sin already, uh, son of perdition, ain't going to be a bother. It's those of you who think you're saved and then you're not. Not you deceivers who are going about causing trouble. You guys, you're whatever. Whatever. But those of you poor people who think you're saved because you just believed, because you fell for the lives of these people. Okay? And see, people are not hearing the Word of God today. They're hearing it from a Bible today. There's a big difference. Oh, there's a big difference. Okay? But see, in your little precious church building, okay? Jeremiah chapter 23 in your precious God, house of God, a little church building, okay? Jeremiah 23, verses 1 on to verse 2. 
Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. This is exactly what devils like David Wood has done. Okay? Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, ye have scattered my flock and driven them away, and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. And that is exactly, dear friend, that's exactly what guys like David Wood has done. This is exactly what the Christians in the buildings are doing today. Okay? And because of that, now these people who are being poisoned by these pastors, okay, they themselves are not innocent. Okay? Prove that to you. Absolutely. Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3. Okay? They're not innocent. Okay? Yes, the people in the pulpits are lying to them. But if they really truly took what God said seriously, they would want to search it out for themselves and see with their own eyes what God saith. But no, they're too quick to trust their uh, pastor from their Jesuit cemetery with the $100,000 piece of paper on their wall. And they trust them blindly because Catholicism te uh, basically teaches don't question the man of God. Because why? The man of God is another Christ. And the Baptist, the one guy, oh, don't question the man of God. The Charismatics, don't question the man of God. Yeah, that comes from Catholicism, by the way. Okay, give uh, give His Holiness the credit where it's due. Right on the money about that. Amen. Right on the money about that. That stuff that the Baptists, the Charismatics, the Calvinists, they're like don't question the man of God. That comes from Catholicism. He was right about that. Amen. Okay, Isaiah chapter three, verses nine on verse twelve. The shoe of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. David Wood, wearing a dress. I rest my case. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him. For the reward of his hands shall be given him. Amen. And let's read verse 12. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy path. So see, it's not our fault. Ah. Okay, uh, Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, okay. See, it's not our fault. We're innocent. Yeah. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 13 on to verse 17. For the people turneth not unto him that smiteth them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore the Lord will cut off from Israel head and tail, branch and rush in one day. You don't seek the Lord who is allowing things to happen. You don't seek the Lord who smites. The Lord who allows Satan to, to do what he does. You don't seek God because of it. No, you go to your pastor. You go here online to see about uh, seven signs that God is getting prepared to bless you by that infamous heretic Mark the Mess. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's continue. Let's continue. Therefore the Lord will cut off Israel from Israel head and tail, branch and rush in one day. The ancient and honorable, he is the head. And the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the tail. For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men, Neither shall have mercy on their fatherless and widows, for every one is an hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaketh folly. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Well, well see, Brad, it's not our fault. Yeah? Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, see, that's that's the lost man in you, and uh, the Adamic nature, as they refer to it as Adam. When he, the Lord gave him a chance to come clean, the Lord, knowing what he did, gave Adam the chance to come clean. What did Adam do? The woman that thou gavest me to be with, she gave me of the tree, and yeah, I did eat. And of course, Adam blows it. God gave him a chance to come clean. What did he do? He blamed, blamed God but blame the woman. Didn't take any personal accountability. No responsibility for his actions. But only glibly. But overall blaming God and the woman. Then of course, God's like, okay, you blew it, Adam. Goes to Eve. Let's see. Will you do it? What are you going to say, right? He knew what she was going to say. right? But he was giving her the chance anyway. Because he's a just God. God knew what was going to happen. Okay? God knew what was going to happen, but gave them the chance anyway, knowing what was going to happen. And what did, I, what did Eve say? The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. So it's not our fault, Brad, really. Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 25 on verse 31. Hmm. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things from you. For among my people are found wicked men. They lay wait. And he that setteth snares, they, uh, as he that setteth snares, they set a trap, they catch men. As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore they are become great and waxen rich. They are waxen fat. They shine, yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. They judge not the cause. The cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper. And the rights of the needy do they not judge. Isn't it interesting? I have found that there are a lot of atheists out there who will judge while the Christians are the ones saying, don't judge. Oh, and you Calvinist guys, guys who follow Dave Wood, you're highly intellectual, aren't you? You're idiots. Void of logic and reason. Okay? <laughs> yeah. They are waxen fat. They shine. Yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. These Christians. They overpass the deeds of the wicked. Because they got a get out of jail free car. They're God's grace. And they're doing things that not even some Muslims would do. A lot of the Christians that come out of these church buildings, they're doing some things that not even pre-Vatican II Catholics will do. I've met atheists and Buddhists that scoff at some... Wow, that, some of them Christians, man. But these Christians, right? Yeah. Yeah. They are waxing fat. They shine. Yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. They judge not the cause. The cause of the fatherless. Judge not, right? <laughs> yeah. Yet they prosper. And the right of the needy, they do not judge. Because judging is sin, right, Christian? Yeah. Shall not I visit for these things? Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means. Are you looking at that? And my people love it, love to have it so. You love it. And what will you do in the end thereof? Of course, Paul talks about, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And in Isaiah, uh, uh, speak not to us uh, right things, speak to us smooth things, prophesy deceits. You love to have it so. You don't want to hear the truth of God's word. Why? Because you don't take God's word seriously. If you did, 
things would be different. But Christianity today does not take the Word of God seriously. Not at all. Not at all. And that, Jeremiah chapter 13, one verse, verse 10, this evil people, which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their own, of their heart, yeah, which walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them, shall even be as this girdle, which is good for nothing, a girdle holding the uh, <clears throat> girdle good for nothing. And we read about the armor of God, about how you were to be had if your loins girt with truth. Remember that that we looked at in uh, Ephesians? About the uh, beginning with how having your loins girt with truth. This evil people which refuse to hear my words. Which walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them shall even be as this girdle which is good for nothing. Christianity today. This is why I'm so adamant against it. Get back to what we called ourselves. Now what the world labeled us. I understand it's not going anywhere, but I don't have to like it. And the Lord convicted me about it and I live by an example. It's not as hard as you think. It's not as hard as some people want you to make it, to make, want you to believe it is. It's not that hard. Actually, it's a little bit easier. I put it into practice, people. You know, when you remove from your, well, I'm not a Christian. What? But you believe in Jesus Christ. Yes, but I'm not a Christian. I'm not what they are. I'm not a Christian. I'm of the Church of God. Or the church of the living God. This is a big difference. Try it. You, you, you people out there who scoff at that, try it. Try it. See, it's not that hard. Okay? But yes, this evil people, this Christianity today is good for nothing. There's no reforming it. There's no fixing it. It's good for nothing. It's a girl that is marred. Good for nothing. And then Zechariah chapter 7. Not, no, not there. Zechariah chapter 7, verses 8 on to verse 14. Zechariah chapter 7, verses 8 on to verse 14. The word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus speaketh Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, and shew mercy and compassion every man to his brother, and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. Now this was when it was works. This is our instruction in righteousness. See, the Christians hate those who rebuke in the gate. The Christians hate those who speak the truth. They really do. But they refuse to hear pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear to go all stonewall on you. It's a shame that a psychological manipulation tactic is named after a legendary general uh, that was betrayed by the Jesuits. Yea, they make their hearts as an adamant stone lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. And you think that you're going to get by today when you read the Old Testament and see what God did to the apple of his own eye? And you think you're going to get away scot-free and that you have a license to sin? Oh boy. Oh boy. Therefore it has come to pass that as he cried, and they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, said the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind, whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them, that no man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. The time's going to come. 
and by then it's going to be too late for you. You don't take seriously what God says today. How are you going to do it when your life depends on it? Why so serious? There's going to come a time, you mark my words, boy. There's going to come a time when you're going to say, I wish I had taken the word of God more seriously. But see, for most of you, when you get to that point, it's going to be too late for you. Why? Because we're going to be gone! And it's going to be the time of Jacob's trouble. And then you got these twits. Just believe. Faith alone from Genesis on to Revelation. It's you who get left behind. Who, 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 you know, who realize, wow, I was lost. You guys who get left behind. Who think you're saved. But then it's going to take a major catastrophe to finally get it through your thick head that you're not. And by then it's going to be too late. You're going to have to die a martyr. And you think you're going to do that then when you can't do it right now. Give me a break. Give me a break. Where are the stones, boy? Oh, but you have them to try to refute the church of the living God. But to stand for the truth? Yeah. Go to Jeremiah chapter 36. Let's look at a very good example of someone who didn't take the word of God seriously. A very good example. Jeremiah chapter 36. Jeremiah chapter 36. Backstory very quickly. Jeremiah had been put in jail, in prison. And Jeremiah chapter 36, let's read verses, where are we? Verses 4 and 6 to start. 4 on to verse 6, okay? Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah. And Baruch wrote from the, from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of a book. See, this was under the dispensation of the law where the Holy Ghost would come and go, come and go, no permanent seal. Okay? And the Holy Ghost, the Lord, gave Jeremiah the words and Baruch was writing and dictating them. Uh, within the Apocrypha, they have what they call the, that supposed letter. Okay? which doesn't line up scripturally anyway, okay? But, okay, you got to remember, this was under the dispensation of the law when there was no seal, okay, where the Holy Ghost wasn't a permanent resident as he is today. He could come and go, come and go, okay? So, you got to keep that in mind. But, Baruch, the son of Neriah, wrote the words that the Lord spake to Jeremiah as a warning unto the people. Let's continue, Okay? And Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am shut up and cannot go into the house of the Lord. Therefore go thou and read in the roll, which thou hast written from my mouth, the words of the Lord in the ears of the people in the Lord's house on the fasting day. And also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that come out of their cities. So the Lord gives Jeremiah this word, and Jeremiah speaks it, and Baruch dictates it. And it's for what? To go and warn the people. Okay? So he goes and does that. Now we're going to be reading from verses 20 under verse 26. Pause the video and read the entire chapter. Okay? That's just a basic backstory. Okay? Baruch goes and does that. And some of the princes are like, Oh wow, man, this 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 is um Wow, we better we better pay attention to this. Okay? They were. They were like, wow, dude, you're saying some pretty harsh. Wow. We better, we better take this to the king. We better go to the king. Let's see what our ruler, our fearless. And this is talking about Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim. Oh, boy, he was a, yeah. Yeah. But this is talking about Jehoiakim during his times. Okay. But the princes, they heard the, the, the words that Baruch said. And they were like, oh boy, we better go take this to the king. 
The king, the ruler of the people. Verses 20 on to verse 26 now. And they went in to the king into the court, but they laid up the roll in the chamber of Elishama the scribe and told all the words in the ears of the king. So, hey, hey majesty, we heard Baruch saying all this stuff. This is what he said, okay? So the king sent Jehudi to fetch the roll, and he took it out of out of Elishama the scribe's chamber. So the king's like, okay, get this roll. Let me let me let me hear it for myself. Let me let me see the actual roll, okay? And Jehudi read in the ears of the king, and in the ears of all the princes which stood before, beside the king. So the king was no longer ignorant. He heard the judgment that was coming. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. And it came to pass that when Jehudi had read three or four leaves, he cut it with a penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Cut it with a penknife. So he read a little, cut it up, Threw it away. Which Bible correctors do? Which Jesuit trained cemeterians do? You know, with their, uh, what is it, 28th Nestle Alon or whatever, whatever number they're on right now. Oh, we don't like that? Cut it out. Throw it in the fire. Put a little, yea hath God said in there. But see, he heard the word, this warning from the Lord. What did he do? Jehudi cut it up and burned it. Verse 24. Yet they were not afraid, nor rent their garments. Neither the king, nor any of his servants that heard all these words. They weren't afraid. Why? They didn't take the word of God seriously. But when Jehudi read it, cut it up and get rid of it. Take it apart. That's what they did. They didn't want to hear the truth. They didn't take the word of God seriously. Nevertheless, Elnathan and Deliah and Delaliah and Gemariah had made intercession to the king that he would not burn the roll. But he would not hear them. So see, there were some. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa you, 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 Your Majesty, th those, those are words. Th those are pretty. Wow, we're, you know that's. Don't you think, Your Majesty, King? Don't you think we ought to do at least consider? But he would not hear them. But the king commanded Jeremiah the son of Hamalek, and Sarahiah the son of Azrael, and Shelemiah the son of Abedil, to take Baruch, the scribe, and Jeremiah the prophet. But the Lord hid them. Hmm. Jeremiah was shut up, and, and so what? Je Jehoiakim didn't know where he was? Uh, apparently not, because it said the Lord hid them. But... What's more important is, what did the king do? He had the roll burnt that had the warnings that were coming to him in his kingdom of impending doom. People pleaded with him. Your majesty, hey, hold on, man. But he still burnt it anyway. And then what did he do? He went and turned his attention to attack those who gave him that word. Does that sound familiar? Come on, come on, people, come on. That's not, That's what's going on today. We, the church of the living God, we're warning you Christians, you lost people, of what is coming. You'll hear it, cut it, throw it away. Some, some, hey, hey, dude. You ain't saying that these... That, these guys of the Church of God, they, they ain't saying what that, that, uh, that lady in the church building is preaching about. 
<laughs> okay? We, we should... No, I don't want to hear it. Hey, you're being judgmental. Who do you? Oh, who are you? Oh, so you know who's going to hell and isn't, huh? Who do you think you are? Coming from the astute, highly intellectual people. Didn't take seriously the word of God. And, and you want to know what happened because they didn't take seriously the word of God? <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 39. Jeremiah chapter 39. Verses 1 on to verse 3. And because you don't take seriously the word of God, All things that were written for time were written for our learning. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army against Jerusalem, and they besieged it. And in the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, the ninth day of the month, the city was broken up, meaning Jerusalem fell. And all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate, even Nergal, Shazrir, Sharazir, uh, Samgar, Nebo, Sarsikam, Rabseres, Nergal, Shazrir, Rabmag, with all the residue of the princes of the king of Babylon. So the heathen came in to the city of Jerusalem. Why did this happen? Because Israel did not take the word of the Lord seriously. And this is what's going to happen to you, dear friend. If you don't take the word of God seriously, you take, don't take God seriously. That is your fate. No, what are you going to do with that, huh? What are you going to do with that? Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 36. 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Okay. Verses 14 on to verse 16. Yes. <laughs> Again. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Listen to me. Listen to me. You Christians out there, you lost people. Eventually, there's going to be no remedy and the Lord's wrath is going to be poured out in great measure upon this planet. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. You're alive today. You have grace. You have mercy. You have today. What are you going to do with today? You are being warned of wrath to come. You need to take the word of God. So don't don't take me seriously. <laughs> A lot of people don't, unfortunately. <laughs> but don't search the scriptures. Do what the scoundrel David Wood claims to do, but doesn't. Search the scriptures. Believe, believe the Bible, right? No, believe the scriptures. Believe the scriptures. Don't believe a Bible. Believe the scriptures. Get the authorized version, not a Bible. Believe the scriptures. Read the scriptures. You are being warned of what's coming. Dear friend, you got an NIV, you got an ESV, you got a Holman Christian Standard, you got a New American Standard. Okay, you got an NLT, uh, uh, whatever, an NIV, non-King James. Those are Bibles. Throw them away. Throw them away. 
Read the scriptures. Search the scriptures. You are being warned of what's coming. Please take the word of God seriously. Of course, of, of course you can't take the Bible seriously because they contradict. Atheists, Muslims, Buddhists, um, Hinduists are quick to point that out. Well, which one? Uh, none of them. The scriptures. Well, that says Bible. Yes, but see, within the pages, it doesn't say Bible. It refers to itself as the scriptures. Okay? You need to take what God said seriously. But see, the Jesuit-trained cemeterians who have ingrained in your head, yea, hath God said, and demonstrated it through all the Bibles they have given you, It's no wonder. But see, you love to have it so. You love to have it so. Second Chronicles 34. Let's look at someone who took the word of God quite seriously. Second Chronicles 34 verses 8 on the verse 21. We have been looking at what happens when people don't take the Word of God seriously. What happens when you do? Well, let's look at a good example of this. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter 34, 34, Josiah. Josiah, a godly king. Made some mistakes, but nonetheless a godly king. Verses 8 on to verse 21. Now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, he sent Shaphan the son of Azaliah and Maziah, the governor of the city, and Joah the son of Jehoaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. To repair the house, meaning it was run down. And keep this in mind, up to verse 8, a lot of what Josiah was doing was absent of the word of God. Hold on, okay? Hold on. And when they came to help Hilkiah the high priest, they delivered the money that was brought into the house of God, which the lights that kept the doors had gathered of the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim, and of all the remnant of Israel, and of all Judah and Benjamin. And they returned to Jerusalem. Now Josiah was being led by godly men, okay? But you're going to notice this. Check this out. And they put it in the hand of the workmen that had the oversight of the house of the Lord. And they gave it to the workmen that wrought in the house of the Lord to repair and amend the house. Even to the artificers and builders gave they it to buy hewn stone and timber for couplings and to floor the houses which the kings of Judah had destroyed. And the men did the work faithfully. And the overseers of them were Jahath and Obadiah, the Levites, of the sons of Meorai, and Zechariah and Meshulam, of the sons of the Kohathites, to set it forward, and other of the Levites, all that could skill of instruments of music with a K. <laughs> also, there were over the burden bearers of burdens, and were overseers of all that wrought the work in any manner of service, and the Levites that were scribes and officers and porters, done under the dispensation of the law where they had a physical temple. And today, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. These church buildings are heresy. They're evil. They come from Catholicism. They're no bueno. Okay? Okay? But see, under the law, people were seeking God. Now, let's continue. And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Found a book. Found it. Was it hidden? Well, verse 14 is very telling. Why? Because if they found it, then they were doing all of this what? Because they had put their hearts and minds first to the Lord. And then he's revealing to them what? Then they find the book. 
So they found the book of the okay, and when they had when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. What's this? And Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered it, delivered the book to Shaphan. And Shaphan carried the book to the king and brought the king word back again, saying, All that was committed to thy servants, they do it. And they have gathered together the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hand of the overseers and the hand of workmen. Now, some of you might be saying, well, see, you don't need the scriptures. Uh, hello? Hello? Do you not see what's happening? Okay, yes, they had their minds and hearts set to do the work of the Lord. But then, miraculously, all of a sudden, along comes the book of the law. Okay? You, you know, your argument is stupid. God, even under the law, it's like made it possible that, oh, what's this? They found the book. See, even under this dispensation of the law, they were not going aimlessly without a written standard, see. Okay? Yes, at first, they were doing a lot of it by the priests were guiding them and stuff like that. But verse 14 tells us what? That the book of the law was not available, but it was hidden. Because what if they found it? And look at this. Look at this. And they gave the, okay, and they, verse 17, and they, get, and, they that, and they have gathered together the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it unto the hand of the overseers and to the hand of the workmen. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king, the book of the law. Now, when Baruch read the warning on to Jeho uh, what was that, to Jehoiakim? Okay, what did he do? He just not moved, not afraid, not nothing. And those were the warnings that the Lord gave through Jeremiah to warn us, like, hey, you better turn and repent. Didn't even phase him. Hence, if Jehoiakim would have heard the book, uh, the words of the law, if he were to destroy the warnings given him, it wouldn't affect him anyway. Okay? But here, Josiah was hearing the book of the word, the book of the law. And it came to pass, when the king heard the words of the law, that he rent his clothes. So he's like, Whoa! Whoa! It's like, Whoa! Whoa! And the king commanded Hilkiah, and Ahakim, the son of Shaphan, and Abdan, the son of Micah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Asaiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go, go, inquire of the Lord for me, and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah, concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured up, out upon us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. So, King Josiah, he hears the book of the law, and he's like, Oh, wow, man, we're in trouble. Okay, do okay, guys. Okay, let, let go up to the Lord. We 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 need to think. Oh, we gotta get right with the Lord right now, cause oh boy, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Our fathers didn't take this seriously. Oh, we're in a lot of trouble. We gotta do something. We better take this seriously. Let's go, wake him. Not even the book of the law. Just the uh, prophetic warning given to him by the word of the Lord by, through Jeremiah that Baruch scribed on and read to the king. They they cast it. They burnt that, treated that as nothing. What do you think Jehoiakim would have done if the word of the law was written or uh, uh, written onto him or uh, written uh, read onto him like it was onto Josiah? What do you think he would have done if he burnt that warning? What do you think he would have done to the book of the law? 
But see, Josiah, he heard the word of the Lord. What did he do? Oh, he took it seriously. He took it very seriously. And, and let's look at verses 26 on the verse 28 here. And the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, this is the answer that he got. So shall ye say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which thou hast heard. Because thine heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself before God, when thou heardest his words against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, and humbledest thyself before me, and didst rend thy clothes, and weep before me, I have, also, I have even heard thee also, saith the Lord. Behold, here is the Lord's mercy. Behold, I will gather thee to thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace. Neither shall thine eyes see all the evil that I will bring upon this place, and upon the inhabitants of the same. So they brought the king word again. So see, that's the Lord's answer to Josiah, because he was humble, tender. He's like, whoa, Lord, please have mercy. We the Lord's like, okay. You're not going to see it in your days. It's coming regardless. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. Okay? Where he says here in verse 28, uh, Behold, I will gather thee to thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace. Neither shall thine eyes see all the evil that I will bring upon this place. Destruction for, upon Jerusalem was inevitable. It was going to happen. But because Josiah took the word of God seriously, he humbled himself. That's called repenting, okay? He repented, and the Lord had mercy upon him because of it. And he didn't see the evil. Evil was coming. Okay, People, are you getting what is being said here? My American countrymen, America is going to fall. America is destroyed. America is doomed. There's nothing anyone can do to save it. America is going down. But individually, you have today. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to take the word of God seriously for once? I don't want to hear that. I will, we're going to do as we always done. Offering cakes to the Queen of Heaven. Things that were written for time were written for our learned boy. Hmm? As a nation, America is gone. And you know what? It doesn't matter what nation on earth you are in. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I, I don't care what nation you're in. Your nation is going to be destroyed anyway. Okay? <laughs> yes. And uh, for some reason I have Ezekiel chapter uh, 9, verse 4 here. <laughs> and the Lord said unto me, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And this was said. At a, this was done at a specific time. This was already fulfilled. This is not about referring on to the mark because the mark of the beast is, you know, you take that, you are doomed to hell. But see, our Lord here in verse four is making distinction between those who what of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. Do Christian do Christians today cry for all the, the evil that America is doing? For all the evil? No. Because they don't judge anybody. God is love. It doesn't matter what you do, right? You can get a tattoo and be a Christian. Uh, yes, those of the Church of the Living God have tattoos. They do their best to cover them up and not boast them. Okay. Uh, go to Joel. 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 We're reading this in the Old Testament because all things that were written for time were written for our learning. History is going. If you don't learn from the past, 
You're going to pay for it in the future. If you don't make a stand for the truth now, what makes you think you're going to do it when your life depends on it? Joel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh. For it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the mountains spread upon the mount as the morning spread upon the mountains, excuse me, a great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. All those people that are controlled and run by the Jesuits. But see, as a nation, can this be done today? Where a nation will fast, blow the trumpet, uh, close their church buildings, get rid of the Bibles and get back to the scripture? That's, it's not going to happen. On an individual basis it can happen. You personally. Hey, maybe in your little hometown too. Maybe, maybe your town. Your town of a thousand people maybe. Maybe. But on a national scale... That's why when you have these idiots talking, and I'm being polite when I say that, who talk about there's a revival coming. That's talking about the revival of the Jews, not for today, okay? A lot of charismatics, uh, you know, the latter rain thing. That's for the uh, fulfillment of the Jews. Nothing for us to do, to do for us today. Nothing, okay? I'm all wearing Joel chapter 2, verses 12 on to verse 17. Can this happen Na nationally on a big scale? No. Can this happen individually? Yes. You need to start taking the word of God seriously, man. Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. And rend your heart, and not your garments. How many, how many have put on the facade? You've changed the way you look. But on the inside, you're still the same rotten person you were before. You've only made the... You've only had a changed life. You're not a new creature. Rend your heart. Not your garments. From the inside out. And turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. And you... you you're crazy. You don't think evil's coming. You're crazy. You're, woo, you're absolutely crazy. But who knoweth if he will return and repent? Leave a blessing behind him. Repent. God needs to repent. Oh, shut up. That means turning from what he was going to do. Okay? And leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Could this happen today? No. No, it can't. You personally? Can this happen for you personally? Absolutely. But on a grand scale, like you charismatics talk about the latter rain movement, you only talk about that for us, uh, for your own financial good, for your own means, not to see the glory of the true God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. No, you're only doing it for your own selfish means. National revival, it's impossible. Personal, that's a different story. Yes. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber, and the bride out of her, her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. I'd like to see these Jesuit-trained cemeterians do that. I'd like to see it. David Wood, has he repented publicly of that nonsensical video he did three years ago, four years ago? No, he hasn't. He relishes in it. Give me a break. Hey, you, you defend that guy? I'm being polite to you, and someone needs to say this to you. David Wood is a lost Jesuit coadjutor, you're defending him? You're pretty stupid. You're pretty stupid. Watch the videos that the Lord gave me to do about that devil. 
Uh, and you'll be no, no longer ignorant. Ignorant you can fix. You can't fix stupid. If that offends you, good. Because if you're going to defend someone like David Wood, if you're ignorant, that's a, a different story. But if you're not ignorant, just you're stupid. You're stupid. You are absolutely stupid. Okay? And let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? <laughs> yeah. Can that happen today? No. Individually, personally, yourself personally sitting right there, yes, this can happen. On a grand scale, no. You need to take the word of God seriously, dear friend. Uh, you go Job 23. Job 23. Job 23. This is what you need to do with the word of God. Job 23, verses 11 on to verse 12. We already read about this. Job 23, verses 11 and 12. My foot hath, hath held his steps. His way have I kept, and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. You need to take the word of God seriously, dear friend. You need to esteem this higher than anything else. He, uh, he has uh, sanctified his word above his name. What does that mean? He staked his entire reputation on his word. Why do you think the devil, through Catholicism, has given you so many Bibles to make God look bad? When our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, has elevated his word above his own name, he has staked everything, he, his, his reputation, all on what? The authorized version of the scriptures. Not the Greek and the Hebrew. This is superior to the Greek and the Hebrew. <gasps> Yes, it is. You need to take God's word seriously, man. Uh, Proverbs 8. Proverbs 8. Verses 1 on to verse 11. Doth not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice? The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. And notice how the fear of the Lord and departing from evil is likened onto a beautiful woman. Note that. Note that. She standeth in the top of high places, by the way in the places of the paths. She crieth at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming in at the doors. Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men, of man, excuse me. O ye simple, understand wisdom. And ye fools who say in their heart, there is no God, be ye of an understanding heart, departing from evil. Hear, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. For my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing forward or perverse in them. They are all plain to him that understandeth. Departing from evil. Okay? And write to them that find knowledge. Again, the fear of the Lord, which brings understanding, departing from evil. And if you have the fear of the Lord and departing from evil, the Lord will give you true knowledge through what the scriptures. Not through a Jesuit trained cemeterian. Okay? Receive my instruction and not silver. And knowledge rather than choice gold. But how many of you cast his words behind your back? For wisdom is better than rubies. And all things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is clean. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life, man. If you fear the Lord, you're going to believe what he says. Jehoiakim, he didn't fear the Lord. He had no fear of what he said. 
Josiah heard the word of the Lord. He uh, he dropped he done dropped his biscuits, man. And he's like, oh boy, we better do something. Like I said, most of most of you, by the time you decide to take a stand for the truth, it's going to be too late. Psalm 119. Oh, we can't get away. We cannot get away from taking the Word of God seriously without going to Psalm 119. We can't. Psalm 119. We are going to be reading Deleth, He, and Veu. You don't know where those are at, huh? I've told you. I've told you, I've told you. Learn to remember Psalm 119 by the little headings there. I'm not going to give you the verse numbers. Look them up. Search the scriptures. Okay? My soul cleaveth unto the dust. Quicken thou me according to thy word. I have declared my ways. And thou heardest me. Teach me thy statutes. Make me to understand the way of thy precepts. So shall I talk of thy wondrous works. My soul melteth for heaviness. Strengthen thou me according unto thy word. Remove from me the way of lying. And grant me thy law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. Chosen the way of truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. What are you choosing? A Bible or the scriptures? I have stuck unto thy testimonies. O Lord, put me not to shame. I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. Where do you find his commandments, his testimonies, his judgments? Right here. He, teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. And the keeping of them is great reward. Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law, departing from evil. Okay? Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. Oh. Oh. That's a hard one, isn't it? And the scriptures tell us that the Lord abhorreth the covetous, abhorreth extreme hatred. Choose the scriptures over what you want. Oh, but that's extreme, isn't it? <laughs> what about what about the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, God our Father? Huh? I guess that was too extreme, huh? <laughs> yeah, I just lost my place. <laughs> Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity, and quicken thou me in thy way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Establish thy word unto thy servant who is devoted to thy fear. Turn away my reproach, which I fear, for thy judgments are good. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. In thy righteousness. Devoted to his fear. You fear the Lord, huh? Then why do you want to be like the world? Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. So have I wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in thy judgments. So shall I keep thy law continually, forever and ever. And I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. I will speak 
of thy testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. And I will delight myself in thy commandments which I have loved. My hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments which I have loved and I will meditate in thy statutes. See, right there, verse 46, I will speak of thy testimonies before kings and will not be ashamed. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But yet there are people out there, and I've met them, who are ashamed what the scriptures say. So they'll go to a Bible where it doesn't say it, or totally messes it up and make it far less harsh. Perfect example, you can go to the mess and find... Um, find grounds for a woman to be a preacher if you read the message. Or the New Revised Standard Version. You can find grounds for a woman to be a preacher because they mess up 1 Timothy chapter 2. You can find grounds for sodomite uh, bromance if you read the message. And the NIV. Because it's all relative, right? Because they're ashamed of what the scripture says. You know, the Lord says, if you're ashamed of my words, I'll be ashamed of you. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Woe unto you that you're ashamed of the scriptures. Woe to you. And you know what? To be honest with y'all, if someone's ashamed of the scriptures, what hope can there be for you? Because God is a spirit. What hope can there be for you if you're ashamed of what God has said? Psalm 119, men. Oh, how, I, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thou through thy commandments hast made me wiser than mine enemies. For they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers. For thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients. Because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way. Understanding. That I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste! Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth! Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. And when you look in Aen, Aen, and when you look in Aen, Verses 127 and 128. Therefore I love thy commandments above gold. Yea, above fine gold. What's the scriptures worth to you? Priceless. He has exalted his word above his name. The authorized version of the scriptures. What are the Bibles worth? Nothing. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. Amen. I hate every false way. I hate Catholicism and all her daughters. I hate Islam. I hate Buddhism, Hinduism, Jesuitism, which is Catholicism. I hate Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnessism. Their false ways. But don't judge, right? Don't judge. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, Psalm 119, none. Learn to recognize Psalm 119 by that. Okay? All right? Come on. Start taking the word of God seriously. Before it's too late. 
Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I have sworn and I will perform it that I will keep thy righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according unto thy word. Accept, I beseech thee, the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me thy judgments. My soul is continually in my hand, yet do I not forget thy law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I erred not from thy precepts. Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined mine heart to perform thy statutes always, even unto the end. And see, that's indicative to us of the Church of the Living God. We live according to the standard of the authorized version of the Scripture. We take the Word of God seriously. You better too. Because we are, you are surrounded by Christianity that takes the Word of God and throws it behind their back and replaces it with a Bible or with the teachings of women like Bible is Mark of Beast or by these people who twist the scriptures. You need to take what God says seriously. You need to rightly divide the word of truth. And I'm telling you right now, if you truly take the word of God seriously, one of the first things he's going to show you is rightly dividing the word of truth. Because if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you become Mark the Mess. You become an easy believism heretic who claims to be dispensational but is faith alone from Genesis on to Revelation. <laughs> brilliant! Brilliant! <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. <sighs> but there again, what happens if you don't? What if you're like Jehoiakim? You want to attack me because I'm warning you. Jeremiah 15, verses 1 through 3. Then said the Lord unto me, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind could not be toward this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. Moses and Samuel. His man Moses. His boy Samuel. The Lord is saying, If Moses and Samuel were there interceding for this people, even if they were to do it. <laughs> what is this? My mind could not be toward this people. L let that sink in on you for a little bit, if it's possible, dear friend. The enormity of what the Scriptures has just said. Oh, well, that's not for today. That's a, God's all love. <laughs> Have you read the first couple of chapters of the book of Revelation? You know the red words about your Jesus who talks about killing people? Your little sweet Jesus who you're going to bro hug when you get into heaven? And it shall come to pass if they say unto thee, Whither shall we go forth? Then thou shalt tell them, Thus saith the Lord, Such as are for death to death, and such as are for the sword to the sword, and such as are for the famine to the famine, and such as are for the captivity to the captivity. Wow. That's going to be fulfilled in its entirety. This, this happened with uh, Nebuchadnezzar, but it's going to happen a hundred times more fold during the time of Jacob's trouble. And I will appoint over them four kinds, said the Lord, the sword to slay, the dogs to tear, and the fowls of the heaven, and the beasts of the earth to devour and to destroy. And, Ze and Zephaniah, Zephaniah, then we'll be done. Zephaniah, Zephaniah, not Zechariah, Zephaniah. Sephaniah is right after Habakkuk. Sephaniah chapter 3, verses 1, and verse 9.
final reminder to you for not taking the word of God seriously. Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. Her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not the bones till the morrow. You know those teachers with your itching ears? Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning doth he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not. But the unjust knoweth no shame. I have cut off the nations. Their towers are desolate. I made their streets waste. None passeth by. Their cities are destroyed. So that there is no man there that there is that there is none inhabitant. Excuse me. I have cut off the nations. Their towers are desolate. I made their streets waste that none passeth by. Their cities are destroyed, so that there is no man, that there is none inhabitant. I said, Surely thou wilt fear me, thou wilt receive correct instruction, so their dwelling should not be cut off. However, I punished them. But they rose early and corrupted all their doings. The more that the Lord may chasten some people, or allow Satan to attack them instead of turning to the Lord they go to Satan therefore wait ye upon me saith the Lord brethren until the day that I rise up to the prey that's what we're doing we're waiting for my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms why to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall de be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Oh, look at verse 8. You know, Catholicism wants to bring everybody under uh, together so that that man of sin, the son of perdition, will rule over them. The Lord's like, yeah, bring everybody together so I can cast judgment upon them. This is I'm scared the hell out of you. Among many things. And verse 9. For then will I turn to the people of pure language. That they may all call upon the name of the Lord. To serve him with one consent. After the judgment of the nations. Which you dear friend. Are headed for. If you don't take the word of God seriously. Why so serious? Why so serious? Because the Lord commands me to be serious about it. The Lord commands me to take what he said seriously. Not to cast his words behind my back. Or to pick and choose what makes me feel good. No. Why so serious? Because the Lord commands it. Please consider these things. So many people out there are just going to tell you how, how to make you feel good. How you're a good person. You're not a good person. And many people are going to tell you, uh, dazzle you with their brilliant intellect. Intellect. But yet, never quoting a scripture or even a Bible. You know, you take your pleasure... And you're covetous seriously enough. Why don't you do the right thing for once in your life? Just once. And consider what God hath said. And take what he said seriously. Because if you think that there's not a judgment coming. You think that, that it's uh, faith alone from Genesis. You just, dude, you're crazy.
I pray you take heed to these things and consider these things. If you're not going to make a stand for the truth today, what makes you think you're going to stand for truth when your life is on the line if you can't do it today when you have the choice? Or you'll stand. You'll stand up against those who want to tell you the truth, who are pleading with you. By the time you make the right choice, it's going to be too late for you. I pray, we pray, that that be not the case. It's going to be it for this video. Part two, technically, will be coming, Lord willing, Wednesday with a little addition. Um, I hope I offended you. No, no, no. I hope the Word of God has offended you. That you consider these things. That you search the Scriptures whether these things be so. And that for once in your life, you take what God has said seriously before it's too late. Thank you so much for watching this. If you do, we love you. We pray for you. Those of us, uh, our brethren, our sisters, uh, thank you to those of you who pray for us and who help us. We need all the help and prayers we can get, especially right now. Thank you for watching this if you do. We love you. We will see you in the next video. Lord willing, that will be Wednesday. Lord willing.